Hi, everybody. Um, so we, if you, those of you, the 62% of you who are already concerned, I predict will end the next 15 minutes. Eric, come and have a seat there. Even more concerned. And the 10% of you who are not concerned, I think it's time you guys woke up. So. Um, we, we know your vote. <laughs> you know my vote. You know my vote because you know I've just been in Ukraine. Um, I have seen the future of warfare in this era. And I actually would add another one, which is I don't think you can regulate it. Yeah, that's my own, my own view of this. But let's, let's talk about what AI means for geopolitics. And Eric, I think, I'm not going to flatter you, but I think you really have thought about this more than virtually anybody else except the late Henry Kissinger, with whom you co-wrote a book. And so I want to start this conversation with a very simple question. Who are the winners in the era of AI geopolitically? And I'm going to say something a bit provocative in the, for this audience. The hyperscalers, the, peop, the companies that are driving AI, are all American companies. They're all in the US. Does that mean that the US is going to dominate geopolitically in the AI era? Well, first, thank you, and thank you all. Um, Dr. Kissinger uh, passed away at 100 and a half a year ago, and his last book, my second book with him, comes out in November on the anniversary of his death. It's called Genesis, and it's about this. Um, the American model is uniquely capable of producing winners in this particular scenario because we have such deep financing scenarios that people can build literally a hundred, you know, $10 billion worth of hardware without necessarily any clue as to how to make any revenue for it, um, which is sort of a gift from God as far as I'm concerned. And what you're seeing now is you're seeing fundamentally a global race between the US and her allies and China and her allies. And uh, I think it's fair to say that both countries are going to be clear winners in this revolution. And this revolution is of a scale larger than the PC revolution, as large or larger than the internet revolution, because it's a revolution about intelligence. To me, the key question is not what happens in the US and China, because we can talk about that, it's pretty clear, but what happens to the other 195 countries, right? It is not at all clear to me how that organizes. Uh, software in general is inexpensive, easy to use, hard to control, and distributed very broadly. In this particular case of AI, the presence of very large pools of capital and energy and the ability to build the data centers will be a key point. Saudi, by the way, could be one of those great winners if Saudi does the right things. But, but let's just focus in terms of national security and geopolitics. You have this, the world has split to some degree. You have these tensions between the US and China. As you say, both likely to be the leading AI powers. Is this a zero-sum game? Let's say China gets to AGI first. What does that mean for the global geopolitical? So uh, the, there are many different definitions of artificial general intelligence. Uh, AGI is the abbreviation. But think of it as the intelligence that we have that computers don't today have. It's a flexibility. It's a creativity. It's a, oh, today I want to learn something new kind of thinking, which today the computers cannot do. But it's coming very, very quickly. So the thought experiment is imagine that there's a secret in, uh, lab in China that invents something with that kind of flexibility well ahead of the West. Just imagine that. And remember, it would have Chinese values, Chinese rules, which are very different from Western democratic view, uh, uh, views. Um, in that scenario, what could occur? So this is a system in our fiction, because we don't know it yet, that could, for example, imagine how to change the world's financial system and the way the banks work. It could figure out a bug in the way the banks talk to each other. Um, it could, for example, um, suggest a new, they're called zero-day cyber attacks. These are unknown attacks on cyber infrastructure. We just don't know. And so all of us who work on this believe very strongly that the West, and in particular the United States, needs to invent this very, very quickly. It is, in fact, a race. It, the fact that we would get there first does not mean that somehow our opponent, in this case China, is vanquished, but it does mean that you can set the agenda. And do you think, there's been a lot of conversation in the last couple of days about AI, governments around the world thinking about it. Do you think enough attention is being focused to the direct national security and indeed military consequences? Um, well, I'm somewhat cynical about military people and organizations because I spend so much time with them. <laughs> 
And the reason I'm cynical is not because the people are bad, they're very, very good people, but because the system is precisely wrong for this kind of a scenario. The entire universe, the entire floor of what you do is changing, and yet the organization, the organizational structure, the priorities, the political structures are not changing. Um, so a typical example is that in conflict, it's obvious if, if you're a technology computer scientist that future wars will be d used with devices that are attritable, uh, multiple, uh, very, very short-term, and very, very mobile. Things like aircraft carriers are exactly the opposite of that, right? So when people like me think about this, we think about why don't you, in fact, build a drone army and deal with things autonomously. So autonomy plus uh, essentially getting abundance is the correct strategy. Militaries are not organized around that. So my view on the AI regulation question is that um, it will be very difficult for governments to, to follow what's going on, but it will also be very difficult for governments to adopt them unless they have secret labs and so forth which operate differently from the current military. I mean, one of the striking questions in, in response to the, the, the question that was asked of the audience, when you are actually at war, and this is what struck me in Ukraine, it doesn't matter what the rules and regulations are, you are going to innovate as fast as you can to stay one step ahead of the enemy. And this is, there's unbelievable pace of AI innovation sure. happening there. Is, do you see that happening everywhere, that warfare will itself define? It's going to happen in stages. Um, you and I have both been to Ukraine um, and to study it and understand it. And uh, in the various sort of war planning that goes on, at least in the West that I'm familiar with, they have relatively static models of how it goes. They assume the opponent has this and the, pro and the proponent has that and then they work it out. Uh, that's not in fact how it works. The way it really works is both sides are at, at incredible speeds innovating. And the general rule in Ukraine is that any idea on one side is adopted by the other side within three to six weeks because they're both watching each other. Um, and Russian tactics have recently changed to copy Ukrainian ones. Ukrainian ones have recently adopted some Russian ones and so forth. One of the big surprises for me in Ukraine has been the, the rate at which Russia, which has historically been non-innovative, would be an under, understatement, um, have, under the enormous pressure of the, the war that they started, they really are changing their own definition of war. They built these huge factories for drones. They took technology from Iran and others and have, and have perfected it, make it stronger. If you look at the drone tactics, the drone tactics are changing every day. When you talk to the commanders, they say you actually have to be in the field because the war is changing so quickly. Both sides are learning how to, and I'm not endorsing this, it's obviously horrific. For those of you who have never actually seen a real war, one, I don't recommend it, and two, they're much worse than you think. I would absolutely yeah. second that. And the number that you just said, the dates, innovations happen within three to six weeks. Yeah. It's an extraordinary pace of yeah. change. But I'll give you another example, and I think you saw this uh, in your most recent trip and you reported on it. So the way the, the, this is a land war, it's a World War I land war, and you have one side and another side. Neither side has air dominance, uh, and essentially one has sea dominance because of sea drones, and that's Ukraine. The, the front line is about 10 kilometers wide. And normally, sometimes it gets down to a half of a kilometer, and those things are death zones. They're the most mined uh, facilities in the world. They're mined because both sides don't want vehicles going back and forth. Um, as you all know, the world has an awful lot of tanks. Um, those tanks are largely useless now. A $5,000 drone can destroy a $5 million tank. Um, I read somewhere that the U.S. had thousands and thousands of tanks stored somewhere. Give them away, right? Buy a drone instead. In fact, buy 10, buy 20, buy 50, buy 100. So the cost of, uh, the cost of autonomy has fallen so quickly that the drone war, which is the future of conflict, will get rid of eventually tanks, artillery, and mortars. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that a conflict goes away. I just think it changes. Can you, and I want to turn to this region in a second, but can you just paint a picture of how you see warfare evolving? What would it look like in two, three, four years? So um, the simplest way to understand it is that the drone world, think of them as a robot world. So uh, if I say robots, you become afraid because you saw all those movies. Drones are much more deadly, right? So this drone world is in air and sea right now. Land drones are coming, and I've seen them in use, uh, are in fact in a network. So the steps are, first, a man, a target, and 
the use of a drone to target it. The next one is a flock, right, a swarm, technically, of drones launched against the same target. The next step after that is a readiness system where the drones are ready, the computer figures out if the threat's coming, launches the drones, and they serve as air defense. Those are the tactics that the U.S. Air Force developed, you know, 70 years ago in World War II. You're seeing that now in drones. Today, Ukraine is ahead of Russia, but not by much in those tactics. So I think a reasonable connect, uh, con conclusion is that in any future conflict, both sides will end up with that outcome. And I should say that I don't know what happens in a deterrence regime when both sides have automatic networks of drones. Um, if you look at the literature and the thinking, people have not thought through what it means to have those systems on a hair trigger. This is the new deterrence problem. And in, in, in Henry or Dr. Kissinger's uh, memory, he pioneered all of this thinking uh, in the 1950s around mutually assured destruction. We don't have an equivalent dogma, uh, equivalent doctrine yet. So you have that at the level of superpowers, yeah. but you also have, because the marginal cost of these drones is very low, you have capabilities for small states or indeed non-state actors, which are very, very different to what they've had in the past. So at both ends, warfare changes. So let's superimpose that somewhat. I, I told you we were going to um, sober this the conversation. Let's talk about what it means for this region and for a, a, a country that has admirably great ambitions in the area of AI, has cheap energy, has a lot of capital. What do you think the geopolitical consequences of AI in this area of national security are for a country like Saudi Arabia? Um, well, again, I'm your guest. Um, so if I say something wrong, I apologize. My understanding is that, that many of the countries in this region are in conflict with Iran. And so if you think about the most valuable assets here, they're easily targeted by drones, right? because they're not moving, and we know where they are, et cetera. And indeed, there were Iranian attacks in this country some years ago. So a reasonable expectation is that all of the national security components within, within these regions will ultimately be protected in a military sense. And I think usually the correct answer will be drones and all sorts of different kinds. Um, this country is uniquely positioned to provide leadership in AI because of the abundance of power a very clear leadership regime that really wants to build it, uh, and the, the both financing and sort of correct connectivity, correct weather, and so forth and so on, lots of sun, renewables. So there's every reason to think that Saudi in particular can become one of the winners, one of the big winners here, if the country puts the money that's in place now wisely and quickly. There are discussions within the government here about how to do that, who will organize it. I'll let them talk about it but they look roughly right to me. So it looks to me like Saudi's on the right path. So in, in the last 30 seconds that we have left, what would your uh, uh, polite advice as a guest be to on how to do that quickly and effectively? The simplest thing for uh, this country to win is to use its abundant resources and create facilities that no one else can build. There is a huge shortage of electricity in the developed world. The US, one estimate is the US will run out of electricity for the kind of stuff I do by 2028. Um, as you know, Europe and Britain, the electricity costs are so high. There's every reason to think that the training and the inference can be done here with the right networks, the right data centers, and so forth. And that's what I think all of us want this country to do. So Elon Musk yesterday changed his assessment. He said uh, it was a 90% chance that AI would bring a wonderful future and a 10% chance of dystopia. You've thought a lot about both sides of this. Where do you put the dystopia brilliant future balance? I think the correct thing is in, to say it is you have enormous optimism and enormous concern, and they're both correct. Enormous optimism because the arrival of a new intelligence that is our partner, that makes each and every one of us as brilliant as the best physicists, the best chemists, the best artists, and so forth, our lives will be changed forever and it'll occur in our lifetimes. The optimism in terms of health, health, uh, health education, the development of your children and your grandchildren is enormous. You, can, you cannot imagine what that is. The same thing is also true for threats against us. So for example, access to AGI by a terrorist. How do you make sure that a terrorist group cannot get such enormous power in an asymmetric way into their hands? These are the great national security issues for the future. Well, we are very lucky that you've been spent so much time thinking about them. Thank, Thank you, you very all. much indeed. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Zanna. Thank you.